What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Speaking Sessions podcast. I've got a very unique guest here. We've got a long history, a long time coming to get on this podcast here. I've got Mike Fitzpatrick here. We met, what was that, 2018 at GrowthCon 3, very long time ago. Been seeing this guy doing the work, putting in the work, making things happen in the lender space, the mortgage industry and the real estate space just in general, seeing him being a loving dad, you know, he's, he, as he says in his bio, fun, loving dad that loves helping people reach their goals. And you can really see that. And he's the founder of Legacy Mortgage. And today we're really going to go into how do you build yourself as a brand to be the recognized person in a world, the lending world, being so Flood it with a bunch of lenders, especially right now with how crazy it is and how do you differentiate yourself. But before we get into that, Mike, welcome to the show. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, it's been a it's been a long time coming. Uh, I mean, just launching the the new company and everything that's been going on. And um, I mean, 2018 seems like ages ago. I mean, we went through the the decade of COVID that we had and um no, it's it's been great, and and congrats on your uh, your second little one coming. I've got two little ones now too, and uh, it's uh, it, it's definitely a blessing to have all of this transpiring at, at such a young age, you know, on on my side, and um, I'm just just grateful for for every opportunity I've had. It's it's been crazy. Mm. Yeah, and it's definitely blessings for sure for both of us, really for all of us, because we all have amazing opportunities in our life for sure. And so I would I would love to kind of hear your thoughts because I mean Grant Cardone and all this stuff, I'd be kind of curious to to see your thoughts. So from Growth Con three being this massive event, and it was it was a spectacle to say the least yeah, yeah. and everything. What was kind of your takeaway from that? And I know we weren't gonna necessarily talk about this at first, but what was your takeaway from this massive event like that? Because I know you go to a lot of other events too, versus maybe yeah. some like smaller events. What what is your idea behind that? And then maybe a little bit more from like the the speaker perspective of like how they're actually pouring into that audience and everything. Yeah, so for me, whenever I go to the the massive spectacle ones, I'm locked in on networking. I mean, that's how we met. That's that's how I've met a lot of people that I'm I'm pretty close with. Um, I think Michael Nast was somebody that I met, one of Grant Cardone's original kind of social media guys. He's the guy that got uh, Grant on live streaming and doing some of the social media stuff that he did. So that's been a light, uh, what I consider a lifelong friendship. And um, I'm in, I'm so locked into the networking aspect when I'm at big ones like that because I, I have ADD a lot of the times. So whenever I go to something like that, it's very hard for me to focus on a speaker that's. 150 yards from me that that may be um, not well heard uh, because of the venue that we we're at. So once I got there and I could I got the lay of the land, I was like, all right, I'm going all in on networking. Uh, sorry, Grant, but I snuck my way into the VIP sections. I uh, I slid my way into the uh, the VIP parties and, uh, and and wasn't wasn't supposed to be in them, but I ended up getting in a circle of people that that just brought me along. And, and I would say that when you go to events or you go to things that you're trying to learn from, especially for for your audience that's like trying to get better at speaking and trying to to do these things, you need to watch the way people operate, um, whether it's the speakers and, and how they network after they're done speaking. Uh, watch the way that people operate. Watch their process because you'll learn more from that usually than from what they say on the stage. If if you if you really pay attention to who they are off the stage, uh, you you learn a lot of the times a lot more than what they say on the stage. Of course, what we say on the stage matters. But if you're the type of person that gets on the stage and you're a hundred, and then you get off the stage and you don't want to talk to anybody and you scurry right out and you don't you're not personable you're probably not going to land with as much of an audience as if you would be humble and have humility to stick around for a minute. Maybe you weren't paid to be there for that long. Uh, but if you don't have a, another engagement to get to, I would highly encourage you if you're speaking on stages 
to to work the room afterwards. Yeah, and that's such a great point, man. That really just creates that relatability and even more trust. And we know yeah. some of these big names, such as Grant Cardone and Ed Milet and stuff, that they probably come into these events and they're right out the door. And we get it. They're busy. They probably literally had that time to come speak, a little bit of a buffer before and after for travel and whatnot, but they're there to deliver the message and leave. But for those of us that maybe aren't at that level, and even for them going in there and just trying to not only share your message, but yeah, relating with the audience, shaking some hands, kissing the babies, so yeah. to speak, and everything is a thing that we should be doing because that's what really helps the event host at the end of the day, too. It helps you as a speaker and business owner because more than likely you're going to speak that you have something that people can get afterwards too. That's what most speakers have. They're not just only getting paid to speak. They have some kind of course or product, yeah. service, whatever that complements their speaking and helps grow their business. And so by going around and shaking hands and having conversations with people, that helps build up your credibility and trust with them. But then also for the event host too, it's like, man, our speakers, they don't come in. And I don't know if you know Tony Watley or not, but He's owner of 365 Driven, and that's what he does. Like a lot of his events, he's like, hey, my speakers don't just come in and speak and leave. They're there for the whole event. They're there yeah. with us the whole time. And I really like that he takes that unique approach because a lot of people don't do that with these retreats or these speaking events, these conferences. It's just speaker comes in, they leave. And there's no yeah. interaction with the audience. And I get that some people, it's, you got to be in the VIP to get that access. And that's fine there. But it's really good as a speaker if you're willing to stay that extra time because that helps the event host and gives that much more credibility for them and makes the event that much more special and unique, too. So I'm glad you brought that out. Yeah, and honestly, it's it, it, if you're just starting out on the speaking side of things, like it, it could lead to more opportunities for you to get on other stages. Like I have sp spoken on a stage where whenever I came off the stage – and spoke to people, I ended up getting three more opportunities to go speak at different networking mm -hmm. events for the people that were in the audience. Um, so it's it's something that when you're first starting out and you're grinding and you're trying to figure out your way, it can lead to more opportunities for you to sharpen that sword too. Yeah, and then on the flip side, like before you go on and speak too, I've, I've done this myself and I've heard other speakers do the same thing. They go and talk to the audience because then mm. they hear what the audience is wanting to hear and wanting to see. And now they can call out that one audience member be like, oh, yeah, da, 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 and bring up that conversation that y'all had. And it's like their their ears, they're just paying full attention and they're bought into you even more. And there's yeah. probably somebody else that feels like, man, I was having that same conversation because you got a group of people that are there for a specific purpose. And so they're all going to be fairly similar to each other. Yeah. So when you call out that one person, other people are going to feel like, wow, you know, Mike or Philip, they're talking directly to me. So yeah, yeah, trying to have that conversation before and after is a really good thing for the rela relatability on both sides. But then, like you said, so many opportunities can come out of the conversation afterwards, too. And too many yeah, people don't think about that. The the struggle is, and it's a book that I I believe in wholeheartedly, which is the how to win friends and influence people. The mm. struggle is whenever you're on a stage, is you don't have that opportunity in that moment to truly sit there and connect and learn from your audience at the same time as you're trying to pour into them. So the pre-show and the post-show is very important for you to understand, okay, the next time I do one of these things, I'm gonna go listen to myself back, see where I got stumbled. But the next time I do one of these things, I'm going to understand where the audience is at. And, and you could be speaking on a multitude of different topics, depending on your background and, and what you do. And connecting with somebody in the audience, like you said, is a, is a huge way for you to influence people while you're on the stage because you understand who the audience is and you've connected with somebody in, in that audience. Mm, such a great point. This is actually a good a segue for us to go in more into the lending space for you. We know it's pretty crowded. We also know right yeah. now there's uh, becoming less and less lenders because of the craziness of that real estate market. But you've been able to survive this long. You've been doing it for quite a while. It's been what yeah. almost a decade overall since you've been doing it. Yeah, I've been doing it since 2015. Okay, um, so, so coming so up on a decade. decade. 
Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Wild well, ride, man. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it, there's been a lot going on since 2015 yeah. for sure and everything, but be, we have a ton of lenders. We have a ton of real estate agents and obviously that's probably your number one, or I would think obvious from outside perspective, that's the number one lead source for you is a lender who brings you a lead for somebody that's wanting to purchase a house. So as a lender, and you're in a pretty populous area as well, there in the Myrtle Beach area, how are you differentiating yourself from the other lenders? I would say that there's there's a couple of key factors when it comes to differentiation. Number one would be value. Um, if you're a lender that is personifying your value as your job description, so there'll be a lot of lenders out there that the way that they present their value proposition to a real estate agent or to a referral partner is like, ah, oh, I'll get your loan closed in 30 days. I'm like, yeah, man, like, but you're presenting your job description. That's not any different than than anybody else that works at a bank or anything that they do. And I would say that if you're going to drive real value to people, again, it's the win friends and influence people concept is connect with them and, and understand what is it do they actually need? So what does a real estate agent actually need from me for me to add to what they do for them to be more successful? And I think that that's the thing that I have done that differentiates myself and my team from just another person that's like, hey, put put a loan in my hand and uh, and I'll close it for you. We're actually coming up with tools and I'm creating ways to drive value to agents, whether it be teaching them about AI uh, and, and just the overall presentation of what their value is. Because you know, you've probably read some things about NAR and the lawsuits and everything that's going on on the real estate side. And it's gonna be very, very important for realtors to understand how to present their, their value to a customer. Um, because they're going to ask a customer to pay for their value at some point if these lawsuits go as far as they could go. And, and that's that's really, I think, the, the the biggest factor on my side that's allowed me to, quote unquote, survive this this craziness over the last 18 months is is just truly understanding what my value is and understanding that it's OK for me to personify that value. It's not egotistical. It's not um, it's not pompous. Like I'm, I'm going out there and I have a heart to help people and, and people that don't know me can say whatever they want to say about me because I do put a lot out there on social media, but I, I truly have the heart to help people. And, and of course I'm a believer. So that comes from a place. And, um, and, and that's what I think has, has set myself and, and, and my team apart is the fact that, that we understand what they're going through and and we're on the phones at the same time as they're on the phones and we're coming up with real value pieces for uh, the people that refer us business that's going to make their life easier and it's going to help them personify why they the the client should do business with us so that drives value back to the agent and and that's really that's really what what changes the dynamic a little bit rather than being like hey here's my job description send me deals and it's all about the presentation. It's just like speaking on a stage or speaking in general. It's all about how you present it and your veracity in which you present it. And I think that a lot of people just get into the mundane of like, I've been doing this 10 years and they lose the spark, man. They 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 lose that thing that got them to where they were at the beginning, which was, oh, I closed uh, uh, a million bucks or a million and a half bucks in a month. I made 15 grand. I've got this huge spark now and and now let me go tell everybody about how great I am and and unfortunately when you get beat up a little bit with the covid times and how many loans that we were doing as an industry that's just it's taxing on you as as an individual and you've got to continue to find ways to find that spark and that could be podcasting that could be speaking that could be driving value you've got to find a way to keep that spark in your life and uh and a lot of people lose that and and they end up they end up losing a lot of business because of it. Yeah. And one other thing I thought about that a lot of lenders like to say, oh, I can get you a half a point or a point less in interest. Like, really? A again. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Great. You can you can write a loan. You can help my client be able to yeah. get money. So, yeah, that's not a differentiator. Like, yes, obviously no. it is because you're getting a lower interest rate. But I mean, that's that's barely anything that I've known plenty of people that will pay more for it, the the same quote unquote same service because they felt like they got treated better or this person yeah. is better for whatever other reason that really doesn't actually provide value within the specific service that they're looking for. But because of these other things and the character of that person, 
that's why they went and worked with them. So that's I mean, so many great points there that that you brought yeah. up. And and honestly, like the the change over in and creating this brand of of legendary mortgage is that that word in itself holds us to a different standard, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. If the, the in, in my team, my team has fully embraced that. So we have a core value called live legendary. And live legendary is just a whole different way of life. You know, everybody's got their own definition to what like that is, what live legendary is. And it's just been really cool to see it, see it progress and and see everybody embrace their version of, of what that is. And it's even permeated into our, our referral partners and the people that are closest to us being touched by us because they're starting to reciprocate like, oh man, I really like that concept of live legendary. I like the way that you're doing that. It seems like you guys have a different gear that you're in right now, and and mm. it's 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 really been humbling to to see it all happen because you know you're on to something whenever it just starts happening on its own and people start like having their own piece to what they want legendary to be for themselves, and that's that's when I really could see like man, this is going to be something special. This is this is something that's osmosisly growing without me putting my actual hands on it, and it's. It's been pretty cool to watch. Yeah, that is really cool. And that live legendary, when you think about that, and I know Ed Milet for saying this, I'm sure somebody else has said this before him, but whenever you build a business, when you build a vision, people need to fit with inside of that vision. So when you say live legendary, people in your company and even outside of your company can think about their vision of what legendary Mm. means for them. So therefore they're kind of encompassed in that or under that umbrella of your company because of that core value and really that word legendary there. So now they can see themselves within your company and working with you and everything. It just gives them a great feeling because who doesn't love to think about what their legend or being legendary in their own mind looks like and what that would feel like when they become that legendary person for themselves and everything. That's a perfect thing that you had there. Yeah. And then I I wanted to go back, you know, with the realtors and and providing this value. This is one thing that I mean, really can go across industry. I'm curious what you do, because I know I know you, you host events and stuff like that. So how are you going about hosting these events to provide that value for the realtors to, again, bring them into your ecosystem so that way you differentiate yourself from the rest of the industry? Yeah, so it's it's a multitude of of different layers. So we'll we'll have some in person events, um, but we'll, we'll we do a lot of of uh, like webinar based type of things. And for my team, I have a, a platform that I've built, Legendary Connect. But then we're going to be building a similar platform for realtors to where uh, literally every week I'm going to be just dropping knowledge and dropping value and. And little courses, little mini courses on how they can use AI to advance their business. And I, I truly think that in the next decade of our lives, in the the sales cycle and the speaking cycle and everything, it's not going to just be like these major course builders that you go speak on a stage and you've got these courses that are built. I think you've got to go a layer past that and have an interactive community that you build. And there's platforms that you can build that kind of stuff on that have courses, but also feel like social media. And I think that that's really the future because people want access. Yeah, I mean the the thing that that brought me to GrowthCon and and the thing that that I had a lot of fun with was gaining access to people that I wanted access to. And so whenever you're whenever you're speaking and and going back to the the beginning is like at the end of speaking, you want to give some people some access to you so they feel important. And it's the same thing with some of this virtual stuff. You got to find ways to leverage your time and give people access to you in in the doses that that you're able to, um, in order to give them what they need to keep coming back. It's like it's like a drug. You want to be the drug dealer, and 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 you want to be the holder of the value. And you got to find interesting ways to do that. And and so COVID showed me a lot. It, through COVID, we before that we were doing mainly in person networking events and and uh, presentations and those kind of things. And then during COVID, a lot of that stuff shifted to, to digital. And now we're able to do both. 
which is which is amazing. And then now you're able to leverage your time 10x, uh, mm. and, and it's been it's been really cool. Yeah, people want to be a part of communities, and I'm really finding it's more like micro communities as well. Mm-hmm. Now we've moved past this, or we're starting to move past this whole like general business thing, and now. I want to learn this very specific thing. And as we get more and more coaches and this has been man, probably about a year ago, but I actually referred a client or a potential client over to somebody else because they're like, Hey, I need a speaking coach. And then as we got talking, I was like, no, these are like, man, I just don't like my voice and my tonality. And I really want to change like the range that I speak in. And I'm like, ah, so you don't need a speaking coach. You need a voice coach, which yeah. seems kind of bizarre, like oh, a voice coach. What? But that's what they needed. They needed somebody that was specialized in that. And yeah, could I have helped them with some tonality? Sure. But a voice coach would help them out so much more. And so we're seeing people want to get a very specific skill set or they want to be around a group of people that are all about a certain thing or maybe a certain couple of topics versus just very generic business or just sales. Like let's let's like really dive in on one thing and everything. That community aspect, especially with COVID, has really changed the game as well. Yeah. People want that community more. And they like I think we've adopted a lot of the the hybrid or the online virtual stuff, but we do like to have that in person as well still, but having that community where you can get on zoom calls like this and have conversations with like-minded people is so powerful. And yeah, if you're building out a course, make sure you get that other side too of that community. And that's also something that I'm working on building out as we speak to put all that together around speaking, of course, and and everything. But how do you feel like these events and just being becoming a better speaker has helped you with your business growth? I think a lot of people underestimate, and this is a sports thing for me, a lot of people underestimate their ability to improve based on watching or listening to themselves. Mm -hmm. And so for me, podcasting and speaking is just that. So whenever I played quarterback, I would always be in the film room the next day for hours. You know, I'd be rewinding like, all right, you you dummy, like, why'd you do that? Why'd you throw that ball there? What'd you do there? And it's the same thing with podcasting and speaking. It allows you to flow better. So when you get really good at that, then you translate that into your business and you get on calls and you're trying to pitch somebody, you're trying to close somebody. It makes it a lot easier for you to do that because they're like, man, nothing trips this guy up. This guy is on it. He knows what he's talking about. He's able to articulate information, he or she, uh, and and it just makes it a much easier process for you to close clients because you're constantly listening to yourself back and listening to what sets you in the wrong direction if you get asked a certain question and you go, okay, all right, I need to figure this part out because when Phil, when, when he asked me this question, like, I had no answer for it and now I got to go research and, mm. and it just makes you makes you better if you if you care if you if you truly care about what you're doing you can learn a lot from listening back to yourself and a lot of people will be like ah oh, man I don't I don't want to listen to myself like ah oh, that's terrible I hate the way that I sound similar to the person that you were talking about and it's one of those things that you just have to do because you do not improve unless you see where you've made mistakes and you move forward and correct those mistakes and it just makes you better. So it's it's had a tremendous impact on my business because it just made me more articulate. I mean, I come from the South, so at certain points I have a draw that I've got to work on. And it's not all the time, but there's there's certain words where like my R's get jacked up and I've got to I've got to fix that stuff, you know, and and it's it's made me a lot better. It's made it's made me a lot of money, even though I've not been super consistent with my podcast. And and this year I'm going to be doing a lot more with that, even though I've not been consistent. The times that I have podcasted and the times that I have been consistent has improved my business business tremendously. Mm, and, and so many good points there. And yeah, even if we have that Southern draw, I think yeah, when we go to speak, I think getting rid of some of it is a good thing. Getting rid of all of it, I don't think is because yeah. that is a unique thing to you. But there are definitely people, especially you dealing with 
more real estate stuff. You're going to have people moving from up north coming down here. And then, yeah, you have that thick accent, if you will. Yeah, what, yeah. what are you talking about there? Like, And it just makes it like, oh, you're somebody different than me. And so there are times where you want to kind of modify that a little bit for sure. Yeah. And, and vice versa, if you're from up north and you speak very fast, you want to try and slow down a little bit. And I guess for us in the south, we want to speed up just a little bit because we can yeah. get very slow when we talk and everything. And I like that you mentioned podcasts, videos, stuff like that have helped you articulate better. What are some things that you could give? Let's focus in like on salespeople, that salespeople besides the reps, I mean, reps, very first thing that you should be doing. And then I like that you said reviewing what you're doing as well, trying to record those videos, stuff like that. But what are some like maybe daily actionable things that somebody can work on in order to get better at speaking? I would say making sure that you are reading a lot. The more that you read, the more vocabulary that you get into the way that you speak, I think will help salespeople out, whether they're going to speak on a stage or they're going to pitch a client. The more vocabulary you have in your tool belt, the better that you're going to be able to articulate things to to somebody, especially on a stage. I mean, you you don't want to have a limited vocabulary on the stage. You're not trying to blow people away with the vocabulary. You're not trying to to make yourself sound smarter than you actually are. I I think that I have a, a talent of keeping things simple and, and and really just dumbing down very very complex topics to being things that are very very uh, easy to understand. And and so you've got to just make sure that you're reading a lot and you're also you're also repping it. I mean the repping the p- piece is is the most important. So if you're not if you're not somebody that wants the podcast or wants to go speak on a stage, I would highly encourage you to record or set up a video camera in your office and record your yourself on your calls when you're cold calling every day or if you're if you're pitching to people because you'd be surprised that how people feel your demeanor just based on the way your face looks while you're speaking on the phone or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, there's there's a lot of people that say you should smile while you're on the phone and, and these different things. And, th- and there is some science to that. The, the more that your body language exudes what you want to try to communicate to somebody, whether it's face to face or if it's even voice to voice, if you're voice to voice, your body language still matters. And I think people lose that. They'll be all slunched down in their chair at their office. And people, believe it or not, can hear that. They, they can hear how dejected you are, whether you're putting a fake facade on or not. And it's something that we in sales have to work on constantly. Yeah. And then even standing up, that helps give more of that energy and everything. And I found for myself, if I, it, when you're on a phone call, you can do this. Obviously, when you're on a Zoom call, on a webcam, you can't do this. But yeah. pacing a little bit as well helps me really think as I'm talking with them and helps me really almost stay focused because now I'm kind of walking around instead of sitting here and, I'll, oh, let me look over here. What's going on over there? And like I'm going to look over here. Like I, I actually, it helps me stay focused and be in on that call by walking. But then I also get more of that energy because it's very easy, like you said, to to slouch down, to to yeah. roll your shoulders forward and everything. And those little things like that do take away that energy for sure. And I just kind of add to that too, speaking of, of taking away energy, and I always like to say this, that just like the camera a- adds 10 pounds to us supposedly, when you're on camera, especially, but even when you're just you know, the audio or on a phone call, you're really losing like 20 or 30 percent of the energy that you're sharing there. And that doesn't mean now you should start screaming into the mic to sound yeah. like you're really excited and everything. But try and raise that energy, really focus on really over exaggerating that energy, which really goes back to what you said about reviewing your content. Because you're probably thinking like, man, I, I look like I was excited. I look like I was engaged in it. And you're just sitting here the whole time talking like this. And yeah, you realize how <laughs> monotone you are, like just how bored you look. And imagine if you were actually on video with that person instead of a, a phone call. Yeah. What would they be thinking? Like, oh yeah, we've got the we've got the greatest product ever over here with my straight face right now. I just love the company and all that we do to help our clients. Like, I don't sound like it. I don't look like I believe that at all. So you, yeah. you really have to show that. And that I mean, that's some solid advice right there. When especially when it comes to the sales game. 
Yeah, I mean, even it, it, you wouldn't do that if you were if you were speaking in front of a group. So why would you do that whenever you're voice to voice with somebody? You know, like you're not going to sit there and be like, "Hey, I'm a I'm a lender. I'm so glad the five thousand people are here, and I just uh, just happy to be here." You know, no, you're going to be animated. You're going to be excited. Like you'll see me use my hands a lot. I'm a hand person, mm-hmm. and uh, and and you'll you'll see like people walk into my office. I've got loan officers walk into my office, and they're like. Who the heck were you yelling at? I'm like, no, nah, I was like really into this conversation. It was, it was a lot of fun. You know, we were collaborating and it's and it's a lot of fun. So it's something that you really should review at least weekly, if not daily, in, mm. in my opinion. Yeah, I, I completely agree there. And so now, you know, we've talked about the speaking, how you differentiated yourself from other lenders. How are you using that to help lead your team? I'm curious on that. Yeah, I would just say by example, you know, I'm I'm the type of person that eh, there's a lot and this this is going to this feels icky coming out, but it's it's true. And and it's one of those things that that I do truly live by. I, I don't ask anybody to do anything that I've not done myself or actively doing myself. So mm. one of the things for me in the lending world is the the less leaders that we have in the in the lending side of things that don't produce the better because when you lose touch of the actual loan like you 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 get one layer removed from the actual loan that you're trying to get to the finish line you become number 1 not super valuable number 2 you just kind of get out of touch with it you know like if you're not touching loans constantly you get out of touch and and so from a leadership position at in any business i would hire highly highly encourage leaders to make sure that at some point during the year, whether it be quarterly, monthly, whatever, go roll up your sleeves with the section of the business that you're not super comfortable with, but like you just need to make sure that you understand it. Like, don't go micromanage that that team. Let that team leader do what they need to do to to run their team. But you need to go maybe sit with that team leader and some of the people on their team to understand. What could I be doing as a leader to to make you guys better? What could I be doing to to drive that ball down the court? And I think a lot of people lose sight of that because they they get out of touch with their business. They just start they start managing their business rather than working inside of their business. And there'll be a lot of coaches that say, "Don't ever work inside of your business. You need to manage it." You know, but every once in a while, quarterly at least, you need to get your sleeves, roll them damn sleeves up. And work inside of your business for a minute so you can understand what your people are going through. Yeah, get back to reality. I mean, obviously, as the CEO, as leadership, you don't want to be literally in the day-to-day every day. Right. That is not good for sure. But yeah, you need to have those touches because I know from a corporate background, that's probably one of the biggest complaints that you have these senior executives that come in and they make these decisions that completely tear apart the day-to-day operations. It's like, this makes no sense when you look at the day-to-day and now, I mean, they've got, they've got their side, their knowledge and stuff too. So there, there is definitely a benefit to what they're saying, but it's, it's very difficult to implement and they act like, oh, I mean, you just start doing it. No big deal. And I've got a, a buddy that he owns an insurance agency and he's the leader but he'll get in there every once in a while. And we've talked about this and he's even showing like videos and stuff that you can just see the difference when he starts pounding the pavement, you mm-hmm. know, going door knocking or they're doing cold calls and he gets in there and does that. The whole team's morale boosts up and he he's like, he jokes around. He says, Hey man, I got to show him the old man can still do it. <laughs> yeah. And everything. Well, not but only that, but love to, seeing it. to that point, like one of the things that we do here is, if you get shut down on a phone call, you're trying to call somebody or, or cold call an agent or whatever, you get shut down, like, come put that on my desk. Let let me call that person now. And and that way I'm constantly showing like, hey, there's there's actually substance to to what I'm I'm telling you. And and more often than not, like the, I had one instance where where one of my loan officers, she was like, this guy just like got me off the phone super fast. And then so I jumped on and literally got us a meeting with their entire group. You know, and and it wasn't it wasn't the show that I'm superior. It was in that moment to show a different way rather yeah. than, hey, the way that you approach this was very, very salesy. It wasn't it wasn't, hey, let me get to know you so I can win you as a friend before I try to influence you. And and that's ultimately what got that person closed. And and that's 
that's where, as a leader, you've got to make sure that you're constantly finding unique ways to show that you that you have value. That way, they keep coming back to you and 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 seeking out the value that you've got. Mm. And, and so, explain that thought process a little bit, because I mean, I, I know what you're saying there, but how do you? Make sure that when you do this, because I could see where this could go bad with the employee where they're like, yeah. oh, Mike just came in. He stepped in and saved the day like cool. But maybe and and I know you didn't go and be like, yeah, you suck here. I'll fix it and make it happen. But how did you go about that conversation besides, you know, the little bit that you said, if you could go into some detail, it'd be awesome, because I think there's a lot of leaders that struggle with how do I show by example without being like, look, this is how you do it, or I'm better and make them still feel good that them being your employee still feel good about it and learn the lesson ultimately from your example. Yeah. It, it, it takes a lot more than just a couple of steps. You know, you, you gotta, you gotta constantly be building that relationship with that person to be able to get on a level where they're going to bring that to you. So this, that when these situations happen, it's not solicited from me. I'm not reaching out to people saying, "Hey, like if if somebody has shut the door in your face, like let me take a whack at it and show you how to do it or or whatever." Um, these are situations where I built trust with this person. So they're mm-hmm. like, "Hey, I don't want this opportunity to go by the wayside because I had a I had a semi warm introduction with this person, but they still kind of kicked me off the phone." Um, can you help me with this? It's, and that's, that's what I mean. Like whenever you're in leadership and you're finding unique ways to show value to your people and build trust with your people, then when they have situations like that, there's no ego involved. There's no, well, Mike's going to make me look stupid or I don't want to look stupid or whatever. There's no ego involved in it whatsoever. It's just, there's an opportunity here and Mike might have a skill set that allows me to solidify this opportunity, and I'd like to learn from him in this moment. So let me go put it on his desk, and let me let me let me listen to what he does, you know. And and that comes from constant trust building, you know. That comes mm-hmm. from constant showing that like I'm a man of my word, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna demean you. I'm not. There's never gonna be a situation where I yell at you. There's never gonna be a situation where I say that you're doing a terrible job, you know, like I'm going to let you know that if you're actually doing a bad job, that that you're doing a bad job, but I'm going to do it in a way that empowers you to do a better job after I've told you that you're not doing that great of a job. Mm. And so how are you building that trust besides like this situation? What are some things that you're doing outside of that to make sure you're continually building that trust? Because as a leader, it's definitely something we need to constantly be doing, constantly filling that bank, if you will, and everything, putting those deposits in. So how are you going about building that trust? Execution, man. You just got to you, you got to execute on a daily and weekly, monthly, yearly basis, day in and day out. You got to be the 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 lighthouse and the north star um, to the people that that look to you for leadership, because if you're constantly faltering or you're constantly not executing, and and that's where like on the lending side, if you're not producing, like what do they have to be really following? Um, and and that's that's why I think that I build trust with people because it's 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 also a difficult thing when your manager is producing. Because there are going to be people that come into the environment that are like, why is Mike always the top producer? Is he taking business from us? Is he not giving us opportunities that he could be giving to us? Um, and it, and that's a that's a dynamic that takes a lot of trust building too. So mm. there's there's a lot of competition that will come after me in particular because they're like, well, Mike produces. Don't you think that you're not producing as much because your manager's producing? And it's just a weak way to recruit, but. It's also uh, one of those things that you do have to build some trust for your people to understand that you're not taking opportunities away from them. You're actually providing them opportunities by being really damn good at your job <laughs> and uh, and 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 making sure that you're leading by example. Mm. And I, I could see both sides that like, hey, you're taking the opportunity away, but also because you're bringing in some of the money too into the, the mortgage business yeah. that... You're able to provide other opportunities for them. You're able to keep the lights on, so to speak, rather than trying to take money off of whatever they sell. You, know, you get a percentage of that commission, which I'm sure that that might be in there too. But yeah, that's the only way you make money. Well, I mean, to me, that sounds a little more sketchy than you're going to close in your own deals to make your own money instead of money off of their back kind of thing. Well, and that's the reality <laughs> is like I I I make my living and I support my family off of my production. I I mm-hmm. it's not that. It, 
And, and that creates a dynamic. And so you got to make sure as a leader, if you're in that situation and that's your philosophy, that you don't let that become an ego thing. Like, well, I don't need mm. you because I make my income off of my production and I don't, yeah. I don't really need you. Like that's, that's so far from the truth because they might bring something to the table that makes me better at my job. And it's one of those things where it's got to be constant collaboration to where you are executing as the leader, which in turn gets them to execute as the the person that works for you. But you also need to be humbling yourself constantly to try to learn from them at the same time and not just being a dictator totalitarian that says this is the way that we do things and there's no other way. Um, and and that, I think, takes unique individuals. I think the most successful people in the in the world are are operating in that that they're not a totalitarian they're they're collaborating and Elon Musk is one of those people that that I do look up to and if you really talk to the people that are around him yeah there's moments where he's like no this is the way we're doing it and there's no other way but most of the moments he's collaborating like how do we make mm -hmm. x better how do we how do we make uh, uh SpaceX better how do how do we do this and he's he's often sitting around a table having these discussions and I think most leaders end up being really good salespeople that get elevated to a leadership role and they lose sight of the fact that like they still need to be good at the sales side of it. But maybe you weren't the one that was the most well fit for that role. You were just really good at sales. So mm -hmm. constantly humbling yourself to get better um, as a leader is is super important as well. Yes, for sure. And admitting when you don't know as much as the other person, because you're in that leadership position not to be the top producer, not to be the one that's the best at whatever service you provide for your business. You're there to lead and manage the team and help the business move forward. And uh, oftentimes that's if they're not comfortable with being a leader, that's what they fault to that. Oh, I'm just going to be good as an operator, as the worker mm -hmm. bee, if you will. And that's the worst thing to do because you you are needed as a leader, even if sometimes it seems like, ah, you're just, you're just a cost to the company and stuff like that. And you're not really the one producing. There is a need behind the scenes, the paperwork person, so yeah. to speak, that needs to happen there to see the vision, see the forest outside of the trees, not, only seeing the trees themselves yeah. and everything. So, very good. But Mike, I'm curious, what's next for you when it comes to public speaking? You got any events coming up or anything you're planning on doing? I, I haven't booked anything, mainly just getting the company off the ground. But I, I would say probably the the second and uh, the third and fourth quarter, I, I'll I'll probably be going around and you'll see me some places. Um, awesome. I, I've got people that have reached out, but haven't haven't booked anything. Want to get this company humming on all cylinders, and then from there, uh, get back out and uh, and start speaking again. Yeah, I get that completely. And a, a sign of a good leader, making sure that everything's good at the home base, if you will, <laughs> before you go out and yeah. go hunting some more. Right. <laughs> Take yeah, care of things is, there and then go out and go on those speaking engagements. So if yeah. people want to follow you, where's the best place for them to follow you? I have been told that I need to uh, build my Instagram a little bit more. My Facebook has a ton of stuff. So you can follow me on Instagram at Real Mike Fitz. All right. There we go. And that's with the Z right at the end. Yep. Z. All right. Just making sure. I, I don't know if you were trying to be a fitness celeb within <laughs> no. all the two or not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nice. Awesome. Well, I got one last question to ask you. So make sure everybody that you go follow Mike there over on Instagram. But if you could only share one message for the rest of your life, what would that message be? Oh, that's a tough one, man. You, you right. stumbled me. Uh, that's what I, I would like to say. Do. I would say love your fellow, your fellow person, your fellow man. Mm -hmm. um, make sure that you're you're operating in grace before you operate in, in anger and, and try to do that as much as you possibly can, because sometimes the quick twitch anger is is going to get you in a lot of trouble. I would say most often than not, it'll get you in a lot of trouble. And it's it's super freeing when you can operate in grace and go, ah, that person might have had a bad day, you know, and I'm not going to react to that. I'm not going to react to that. I'm not I'm not going to bring myself down to a place to where I'm going to let them rile me up. I'm just going to show them grace and I'm going to move on. Mm. And, uh, and, and that, that truly has changed my life. I, I used to be that, that person that would, uh, would react in anger or react in a way that I would gossip or I would, I would speak ill will of people. And, and I just got to a place of, 
uh, of being like really shackled by that and just basically said, you know what, from now on, I'm just going to show people grace and I'm just going to either move on or I'm going to kill them with kindness straight to their face and uh, be like, hey, hey what, what's going on with you that you feel like you need to you need to attack me in that way? Or did, what about what you just said to me makes you feel better now that you've you've let that out? I, I'm sorry that you feel that way, but um, what is it that's going on in your life that's that's going to make it to where you feel like it's okay to treat people that way? And and when you speak to people that way, that direct, a lot of the times they go from here to here trying to hug you like that. Mm, spoken like a very mature leader right there. That's definitely, I would say, one of the harder things for a leader to do that, to be able to just to, to get outside of themselves and outside of those emotions and just look at that other person. And then, yeah, like you said, th they must be hurting or something's going on mm. for them just to lash out at you like that. As long as you, you're you the one that's always being kind to them. Now, if you're being a jerk a lot of times and they're lashing out, Probably because you're a jerk. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but if you've been a good person to them 99% of the time and they just lash out at you for whatever reason, yeah, there's something else going on there. It's not you. You just happen to be the person that they probably honestly feel most comfortable doing that to. They they realize that you're probably not going to blow up, blow up on them for them blowing up on you and everything. But yeah, yeah that's a great message. I like that message a lot. Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, Mike, man, we appreciate you coming on, sharing so much value about how speaking can impact your life, your business and everything, and just be able to help move you forward and differentiate yourself as a business owner in your space and everything. Yeah, man. I appreciate you having me.